Hey everyone, it's Alan over at Cobbler's Plus again, and here is uh, part two of the Alan Edmund strands that we're doing for Simon. Uh, we've got everything all cured and ready to go. I have trimmed up the edges a little bit, and it's uh, time to continue on. So come join us and check out part two of this uh, video. I'm Alan Trushkov. Join us today and enter our world of a cobbler to see the craftsmanship it takes to rebuild and restore footwear and other leather goods as well as recommendations from our industry. So as I mentioned, uh, we'd have to do two parts on this just because it's gonna definitely take a little bit more longer um, with this video because there's a lot more to do with this uh, pair of shoes here as well. Um, trying to be a little more detailed about the different things that we're doing for these. Um, we're over at one of our sanders here. I had already mentioned that I had uh, touched up the edges with our finder sandpaper just a little bit to make sure that everything's nice and flush, uh, especially since there are so many layers. There's two layers of leather, two layers of rubber, basically. So, you know, it's uh, a lot of material there, in other words, of different uh, different compositions and mixtures and all that. But at this point, we're going to go ahead uh, and uh, finish out the... Uh, channeling on the rubber portion since we already did the channeling up here now we want to go ahead and channel the rubber half sole on here a little bit and uh we're over at our channeling machine which i need to readjust i just used it for something else so i gotta readjust the depth on it just a little bit and uh be right back all right gotta readjust it to the proper depth um we have this stopper right here kind of prevents it from sliding off or anything gets us the proper depth that we need uh, need on these um and so we'll go ahead and get started off by spraying it down with some water just on the rubber portion i'm going to try to avoid getting it on that leather even though this, uh, this has wax on the bottom here and it should hold up fairly well it can still leave a little bit of water markings and i don't want that to happen quite yet until we really start applying some wax on there and get it uh, going but we're not going to apply any more to that bottom until we're further along so Without further ado, let's go ahead and continue on with uh, with channeling this. All right. Alright, so we've got the channel cut out on here. Um, and now, there's a few pointers that I want to point out real quick uh, before we move on. So, the reason why I spray this down with water, especially with rubber, rubber of course is very sticky and grips very easily. This is a metal trimmer, oh, kind of warm there, metal trimmer right here, or uh, channeler. So, when you've got rubber like that, there's a lot of resistance. And so, basically, what this thing is trying to do is just yank the shoe out from me. And there have been a few times where I actually hit this with my thumb or another part of my hand. There have been a few times that the shoe just got launched out of my hands. And it's not just me, it's happened to countless cobblers. Um, that's why there are so many uh, shoe manufacturers and boot manufacturers out there that don't channel uh, rubber soles, whether it's a uh, half sole style like this or a day-night sole or a vibram sole they just stitch right over top of it a lot of cobblers do the same thing um but that's a very common thing that's why usually you know if you're comparing you know prices all around if say you're giving us a call to find out what prices are and everything um i, I don't like giving prices over videos just because things change prices can go up or down at any given moment depends on material cost demand and all that kind of stuff and uh, so I don't like posting them on these videos because say I post this video today a year exactly from today the price may have skyrocketed or it may have gone down a little bit or something who knows we always try to keep track and be honest on our prices but obviously because we're taking those extra steps of channeling things like even rubber soles it does come in at a little bit more of a premium cost it takes uh years of practice and uh 
trial and error and a lot of you know scars like these guys here you know a lot of mistakes that we've made and stuff over the years so you're not just uh, paying basically for just the service it's the years upon years even decades of experience and knowledge that a lot of us cobblers have built up so Keep that in mind if you're trying to compare prices and say, oh, well, that cobbler down the street is, uh, you know, $20 cheaper or $50 cheaper or whatever it might be. There's a difference, you know, and this is uh, one of the key differences with Allen Edmonds, for example. A few of their stores actually refer us for a recrafting service because the managers there at those stores, they've seen our videos, they've seen pictures of what we do, and they realize that there's there's a difference between the original factory recrafting and what we do as well. There are some shops that actually provide a repair service and recrafting services at a much lower cost than even what Allen Edmonds charges. Now, you know, quality-wise, I'm not going to say, you know, they're worse or anything like that. You know, they might do a great job. It's just that there are certain things that they still won't do. They won't channel a rubber sole like that here at a lower cost than what even Allen Edmonds charges because Allen Edmonds does not channel their uh, soles to be able to stitch and have that stitch sitting inside the channel. doesn't matter what brand it is. Just about every brand out there on the market, same story. It could be a pair of Allen Edmonds like this that are, you know, uh, four or $500, $200 if you get them on sale, whatever it might be. Uh, or it could be a pair of uh, shoes that are a thousand plus dollars. They don't channel these. I've worked on shoes like that, that from the factory, they are not pre-channeled on a day-night sole or any other rubber soles like this. So I just thought I'd point that out. Now at this stage, we're basically done with the channeling. I'm gonna get in here and clean out some of this, take the compressed air, blow it out, grab a brush like that and kind of brush out some of the areas here a little bit to get all that dust out. And then we're gonna move on to cutting out the toe plate section here. So ideally, it's always best to cut it out before we stitch it. Um, sometimes we miss it or something, but I've realized that because again, this is a rubber and everything, we're able to carefully remove a chunk of this if we accidentally forgot to cut out beforehand and save the original stitches and have them just settle down a little bit deeper and um, add a sealant on there just for extra precautions. But this time we're catching it in time, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this all marked up and get ready to cut it out. So let's move back over to the workbench for that. All right, so we're back over at the workbench. I cleaned out uh, a lot of that channeling area there and everything. So all that dust and everything's out and out of the way. Now we're gonna go ahead and start marking up the French toe plates here. Okay. Now for French toe plates, I'm gonna grab a pen here and mark that. For French toe plates, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, no, these are not intended for tap dancing or anything like that. And uh, you'd be surprised how many people actually think that they are for tap dancing. They're not. For tap dancing, you need the metal plates to be a little bit larger. They go closer towards the ball of the foot, like right here, and they don't go to the very tip. And then of course on the back of the heel and uh, they sit on top of the material and have a plastic piece that gives it a gap so that when somebody's doing the tap dancing it makes a clicking sound actually where with these because they are designed to sit flush with the sole so we got to cut out a piece and they sit so tightly in there we put them in with screws that are you know going to hold it in nice and tight it's designed to make as minimal noise as possible, if if even any noise at all. So these are definitely not for tap dancing. French toe plates, they come like these here. They also come, I can remember which drawer I put them into. There we go. So these are the Triumph ones here. They're the gold, gold colored ones. And then these stainless steel ones, are the Lulu ones. And um, as you can tell, there's a bit of a difference. So the so these in general, I mean, even though these are gold colored, they're actually a stainless steel plated with uh, brass, I believe it is. Yeah, so brass plated. And I believe it's stainless steel underneath, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Where well, these ones are just a straight stainless steel. Um, now, they're the gold ones, mainly it's 
due to color as far as if you're looking at color but the design of them this one definitely gets a little bit better distribution as far as uh, how it fits onto the shoe they also uh, end up being a little bit uh, more universal for a number of different shoes where and boots where these ones they come in different sizes this one comes only in one size but because of the way it's designed it fits a number of different styles of shoes toe types um, different sizes of shoes this one however you have to get the right size like this one here's a 50 mil 50 millimeter there's a 60 70 80 and i believe a 90 and then there and then it goes down also to 40 30 20 i believe i don't think there's a 10 millimeter because that'd be pretty tiny there but I, but i believe there's a 20 millimeter that i came across i can't remember all the sizes off the top of my head and uh, we try to stock all of them but right now i'm out of stock of a handful of them after the move uh kind of not really ordering too much of anything so uh thought i'd just uh, show that but what these do obviously because they are metal they're gonna hold up longer than rubber they're gonna hold up longer than leather as well uh, so they're going to reinforce that toe. So if you're somebody that has a tendency to wear out your toe a little bit quicker than anything else, um, that particular walking pattern, because everyone does have a different walking pattern, if your particular walking pattern and style of how you walk wears out your toes quicker, um, you're going to go through soles a lot faster in the long run it's going to cost you a lot more and if you don't catch it in time you're going to wear into the welt area right here where the sole is stitched to then you have to have the welt replaced which adds to price and uh, overall it ends up being more costly for you and in some cases you might not even be able to save the shoes even with new welt i've come across a handful like that where somebody wore them down so badly on the toe and they still had plenty of wear in the ball of the foot area um, but they wore out that toe so badly they damaged not only the welt but the leather as well right underneath the welt and recrafting that i mean it's doable but it's not cheap because we basically have to replace the toe cap and counters and all that and just it, it's, a, it's a huge mess that costs a lot so you know Keep an eye on that if you're not getting toe plates. Um, otherwise, as a precaution, you could always get toe plates. But in general, rule of thumb is when you come home at the end of the night after you've been wearing your shoes all day at work or out at, you know, at a party or who knows wherever you went to a wedding, you know, you're supposed to grab a horsehair brush anyways and just kind of buff over the shoe. If you had a good polish that was applied here, that the wax would kind of remelt and. Uh, Bring back a shine but what you're doing is trying to remove any dust or debris that may be on there and you don't want settling in on it too much um, during that period you're able to while you're holding the shoe in your hand brushing it off you just kind of go around and then you flip it over check your heels back here to see how far down you've worn into the top lift of the heel and uh, check your toes the ball of the foot real quick press down the sides right here um, Again, everyone has different walking patterns, so you'll noticeably be able to tell right now because we don't have a finish on it. You can tell we've got the half sole there, we've got the leather, midsole, and then the uh, welt. And so when you have a finish on there, it's a little bit harder to tell, but you can still see fine little lines from where the midsole might be. And that's if your shoe has a midsole, where your sole is, where the welt is. You want to catch it roughly about halfway through the sole itself now granted these are getting into rubber half soles so once these rubber half soles are worn down about three quarters of the way definitely want to start replacing it then halfway through that rubber you want to keep an eye on it now if you didn't have that uh if you didn't have that rubber there the half sole then keep an eye for the leather at about halfway point that's when you want to make sure you replace it you can push it for three quarters of the way there but you don't know 100 percent sure how the rest of the shoe might be holding up because the other walking pattern that people wear out is the ball of the foot some of you may be familiar because you wear out a hole right here in the middle um, just press down on it if, it if it feels kind of soft and cushiony um, kind of bounces around or smushy or just soft in general you can feel a difference of how how much thinner it might be right here versus like 
back here if you press down on it. So just test it back and forth and see, you know, so this is what it's supposed to be like because this area doesn't ever get wear, basically, unless you're riding motorcycles or bicycles with it, which I don't really see anybody doing that too much with dress shoes that often. But uh, just check to see, press down, okay, that area is nice and firm. Press right here, it's close, but it's, it's a little bit softer. At that point, um, you know, you, you kind of want to make it one of those things where you can decide whether you think it's time to replace that sole or if you can at least bring it over to a cobbler for a cobbler to take a look at it in person and be like, yeah, you've got maybe maybe another good handful of wares to go, maybe like half a dozen or a dozen wares roughly, give or take, or yeah, that's getting really thin there. It's definitely time to replace it. So just keep an eye on it. That's that's what I'm trying to say, basically. Anyways, uh, we've got it all marked up with our pen here for that uh, toe plate. And we've got our razor like that here. And we'll go ahead and start cutting it out. Now, obviously, you everyone that's watching, you wouldn't be able to see the pen marking that I did here. However, I can. I could use a silver pen to mark it. And a silver pen is quite literally... It's silver, I'll go ahead and write it on the bottom, kind of like that there. But the problem with the silver pen, the tip on it is a little too wide and it just uh, doesn't give me an accurate lineup of everything. So, you know, unfortunately I'm gonna have to do it this way. So that we'll get a, we'll get a more accurate marking of where everything's supposed to go. And doing this uh, with a rubber sole is a little bit different. I guess you can say it's uh, not harder, not easier. It's just, it's just different. In other words, um, cutting down like this. If we were doing this on a sole that was just straight leather, no rubber protective soles or anything like that on it. Um, we would, uh, we wouldn't even use a pen to mark it. We would actually use the razor right away to, to use as our marking guide. Or on the rubber, it just bounces back so it wouldn't make a difference if we just use the razor. Now, if you're somebody that likes an all rubber sole like the Day Nights, uh, the Vibram soles, you can't do toe plates on those, okay? You can't because these have to be secured and attached somehow to the shoe and we use screws to do that. Uh, it's even worse if you're doing nails, but we need something that is very uh, rugged, very hard. Leather is significantly harder than rubber is. Always has been, always will. So you can never, you can never expect to have toe plates done on a rubber sole. I have uh, thought over the concept of how it could possibly be done, just thought it over, never never attempted it, but every outcome that I could think of just, I guarantee, will not turn out good. So keep that in mind. I had a few, few people actually request that they're like, oh yeah, I'd like to get the day-night soul or the vibrant eaten soul or something, and then Oh yeah, and can I get also toe plates on it? Mm. <laughs> Not gonna happen, sorry. Doesn't work out that way. There we go. Beautiful. Sits there nice and flush like that. I gotta hold it in place like that temporarily just to let everyone see. Oh, sorry. Just like that. And uh, once, uh, once we have it all stitched up, we'll be ready to start running the nails in. And... I still have to also rough this up, but I'm going to do that real quick before I start getting ready to stitch it. Got to make sure to rough it up just a little bit more because there's the wax and dye there. And it's, it, I mean, it's not bad, but I'll just run it through the sander one last time. And then I'll be re getting ready to stitch it. We'll get the toe plates on. We'll get this all glued up and I'm ready to go. I still have to sand the inside of this... Uh, heel base, heel block. Sorry, I'm spacing out here. It's getting towards the end of the day and uh, maybe I could go make myself another 
cup of tea. Yes, I do drink tea every now and then too, not just coffee sometimes. I already have my coffee for today. It's time to switch over to tea. But let me go ahead and uh, get this all going with the sanding and I'll meet you back over at our stitcher and get ready to start stitching everything. So we'll see you back in just a little bit. Oh, by the way, before I go, I almost forgot. I did do the other one already off camera. So both of them are cut out, ready to go. And uh, yep, yeah, ready to move on. Okay, so we're over at our machine. This is uh, what's called an outsole stitcher. It's got a couple of curved needles on it. Well, a curved needle, a curved awl, and a channel knife on it. We've got our channel knife set on the lowest, which is basically nothing because we've got a pre-grooved channel already set in here, so we don't need to deal with that. But basically what it does is it stitches these Goodyear welted shoes for the outsole stitching. So um, the stitches that you see right here that we pulled out there, possibly, these are going to be stitched with the brown thread like it was originally and then the bottom right here is going to be with the red now these uh, types of soles and shoes are stitched upside down typically so it's very challenging in other words to gauge at um, where we're hitting as far as the top here we're always trying to aim for the original holes but because we're stitching upside down, it's not a guarantee, unfortunately. It actually comes down to a matter of years of experience, practice, trial and error, to finally fine tune where the stitches hit. Um, and I'm fairly confident that I've gotten this down pretty good. It's just a matter of making sure to adjust the machine properly and the whole feel of where everything's hitting. Now, typically, what I need to do is typically what I would do is uh, spray down the whole entire sole but again because we've got the bottom finish already on we don't want to spray down the whole thing so we're just going to spray down this rubber area there and a little bit of the toe the water that we spray down with will help lubricate everything to slide properly because of course the tread pattern on the GTO cross hatch and the rubber material it kind of grips a lot it would help with the leather too but since we already put a finish on there we don't want to um, you know do anything to the finish that may potentially compromise the appearance of it afterwards so we're not going to spray that down but you know we've got that uh, we've got that conditioner because the uh, the cream that we use has almond oil in it sorry I can't think or talk today it has the almond oil in it so it's going to do a nice job conditioning that leather just long enough for us to be able to stitch it and it'll soften it it's going to of course just kind of evaporate it'll condition the leather but the softening aspect of it will basically dissipate and so the JR sole will go back to being a little bit harder so we're kind of timed on all of it in other words I can't leave these overnight to really get finished out and all that that's why I'm continuing on from where I left off actually today from the previous video so let's go ahead and get started off so I can talk for a second but we always start on the inside area of the shoe right where the heel base is so that all the threads and everything can end up being secured however they may need to and in this particular one we're going to do a little bit of a different method we're going to pull that outside strand through if I can without ripping it oh. And just leave it like that. There's a little nub there. I'm actually going to go grab some adhesive sealant real quick and put just a small dab so that it gets secured right underneath here. Okay, I've got it here now. So just put a little bit of a dab here and there and just press it down. Now this is, I'm doing this on purpose just to show a different particular method. A lot of times what I end up doing is just clipping both ends, in other words, from the welt area and from the sole area and 
it's not going to unravel. I've had questions about that. Like, how do you secure the ends of the thread? Well, you don't, really don't need to because the thread ends up locking, so it's not going to come unraveled. The other thing is because the heel base is going to go back on, that adhesive as well secures that area there. That's why we end up starting right in that spot. But I thought I'd do it this way just to show you one option, in other words. They all work out the same, they hold up very well, they don't come unraveled, they don't come undone, so I don't want anybody thinking like, oh, he does uh, different on all other shoes. They all work the same. They don't come unraveled, they don't come undone. You have nothing to worry about. Even if you wear out, say, the toe area right here and you've got good your welt stitching like that or a Blake stitching um, method on your shoes, just because you wore through the stitches doesn't mean it's just gonna all come unraveled usually doesn't because there's adhesives that you have to also keep in mind that hold everything in place and um, you know that there wouldn't be any issues but let's go ahead and continue then <laughs> transition here between the leather area and where the toe cap is so I manually kind of lift it up This is typically what we do. We just clip right there and clip right there. And that holds up plenty well. So, just double check how everything is. Looking good. All right. So, I'll go ahead and finish out the other one really quick. Now, one of the other things I'll point out too, and maybe this might help some of the other cobblers that might be watching. One of the ways that I like, um, like being able to feel a little more comfortable about making all the original holes as much as possible. Now, every now and then you may have one or two stitches that kind of skip or anything like that. But um, one of the best methods I've come across is trying to get the thinnest needles you can for the machines. Thinnest awls and thinnest needles and the reason why is because they bend just enough to try to hit those original holes here um, without really breaking too much now. However, because they are thin, there's a higher tendency of breaking needles. So for the cobblers that might be watching, if you're somebody that already breaks a lot of needles when you're stitching, I'm not judging, I'm not saying anything bad about it, but if you're somebody that already does you know, maybe switching to the thinnest needle might not be your best bet. But let me go ahead and stitch up this one real quick without talking too much on it.
Okay. Clip that. There we go. Double check. All right, looking pretty good there. Not too shabby. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I've sanded out this area a little bit. Go ahead and start gluing things up here while it's all drying. I'm gonna go ahead and put on the French toe plates, but before then I gotta blow everything off to get that water off so it doesn't get in the way of anything. So let me go ahead and get that taken care of then. All right, so we're back over here again. I've got uh, this area glued up, uh, second coat, as well as the heel bases glued up with the second coat as well. So they're all drying right now, so I have to be careful not to lean into it. I did uh, end up varnishing the inside of this heel block right here with some wax right now. That'll help prevent uh, the glue sticking too easily to this area because sometimes you get a little like strand of glue somewhere or something which happens so it makes it easier to clean up afterwards and off afterwards also when it comes down to having to put the top lift heel on here we still have to sand this out a little bit so that it's as flush as possible makes it a little bit easier so we don't have to get down too far with any kind of waxes or varnishes or anything like that but at this point i'm going to go ahead and start putting the toe plates on while everything's drying just kind of get everything lined up nicely and so we take a punch all like that there and just start punching the holes Oh. Okay, that just marks them up, and then I'll just give it a light tap. Oh man, I'm shaking. <laughs> if any of you guys are familiar with uh, Steve out at Beatles Leatherworks in Virginia, he shakes a lot too, so it's kind of surprising that I'm shaking, but I did just kind of bust up my hand a little bit. Oh man, looks like I got that side too. I didn't realize how badly I scratched up my hand just now. It's all dried up, so it's not getting anywhere. Just kind of a nuisance. But yeah, so my hand's a little shaky right now. Doesn't mean that I'm going to do any worse at what I'm doing right now. Just means that I'm just shaking. If Steve can do it, I can do it. Oh, sorry. Ended up hitting that camera there. Uh, I gotta figure out which one of these little containers has my screws in. Give me a second. I also have to get the drill bit in place and get it going. Sorry, I couldn't find my screws. They were in the wrong spot, but got this little drawer filled with them. Oof, almost lost one. So, punching these, of course, um, you know, a lot of times when we're running nails into certain parts of the shoe, we try to angle them certain directions uh, just so that they sit a little bit better in some areas. Where with the screws here at the toe, however, there is no angling. You gotta go as straight as possible, basically. Otherwise, it kind of shifts around this toe plate just a little bit too much. But okay, and it's kind of like uh, when you re replace tires or something on a car. You don't tighten down all the screws quite yet um, until you get them all into place and then when it's finally all in place you end up finally going in and tightening everything down. Sorry, I don't know if my hat's in the way or what. good all right so this one's already here I'll go ahead and do the other one I just want to make sure I've got any kind of gaps now sometimes what happens is because these are slightly rounded and on some shoes you got to round them off a little bit more some you have to actually straighten it out a little bit more in this case we're gonna round it just ever so slightly 
out. So we'll go through and just tap these corners just a little bit until we get it to set just right. not applying too much pressure with the hammer. I have to go through back and forth and back and forth and just see how it's all sitting. Okay. There we go. Now one of the dilemmas also with uh, the Triumph ones is because there's only three screws in here. And so these three screws don't exactly press down and all the spots like if you were to add one on each side here it'd be a little bit easier to get everything leveled out because the screws would kind of force it into position but because there's only three of them um you know you kind of have to maneuver the toe plate or sometimes you have to adjust it like there have been some shoes that i've gotten in that were very very flat on the toe area they weren't so rounded where these ones are a little bit more on the rounded side um but they were so flat that I had to take these toe plates and actually flatten out beforehand, hammer them out. Um, you know, sometimes we, us cobblers, we do have to do certain adjustments with uh, toe plates. I'll kind of show it with this one. There's a handful of times where we have to flatten these ones out as well, the Lulu ones. And every single time also we do have to drill out these holes a little bit larger because these holes are very tiny and from the look of it they're almost made to be used with a nail not so much a screw well the screws that we have here are some of the smallest ones that are long enough that they'll grip and uh, work just fine it's it, it's one of those mysteries for cobblers we've been trying to all hunt down um, screws that fit those lulu toe plates without having to deal with all this drilling and tapping out but it doesn't always work out the way we want it to unfortunately so we have to do a little bit of customization to them let's see okay Get those marked up Sorry, is my hat getting in the way? I can't tell. Okay. If anyone's wondering why I'm using a drill instead of trying to do hand tightening or any of that, it's personal preference, obviously. Um, I'm so fine tuned to this particular drill here that I can tighten it down without breaking any kind of screws or overdoing it or any of that. In our industry like so many other ones as well a lot of our a lot of our work is all about feel it's like a sixth sense cobblers have we we feel the leather we feel the way certain nails sit or anything you know just it's all about the whole feel situation of everything you know we we look at it and visualize it and see it but that's one of the other things that makes it challenging when somebody asks, um, you know, the side of my shoe ripped, can you fix it? You know, sometimes if you have like a blowout here on the side, it can be fixed, but I really have to actually feel that leather because sometimes that leather can't withstand any kind of patchwork, any kind of stitching whatsoever. And so feeling it in person is the ideal thing. You know, if you're say somebody who's shipping a pair of shoes in from out of state to us and you want us to do some kind of stitch work like that we can identify a fair amount through a picture but 
in the end, final decision is once we see it in person and we feel it, we move around the leather and be like, ooh, it looks like, you know, such and such might be a little bit of a problem. I can't guarantee how well it's going to turn out. Or, oh, yeah, these ones turns out a lot, are a lot better than what I, init what I initially expected in the photos and all that. So, you know, it just ended up being one, it ends up being one of those things that a lot of us cobblers go off a of feel. Uh, there are certain ways to identify certain leathers or materials by even smell, too. And apparently there's a handful of cobblers as well that I've come across, and I've actually come across a few like this in person. They taste. Yes, they do. They taste it. Like, I've come across a few guys that can lick a leather sole, which is, I know sounds disgusting. It's disgusting to me, too. And they'll be able to identify, like, oh, yeah, these ones are, um, you know, a uh, good grade here. They they most likely have this kind of tanning process done to them. I've come across two cobblers like that. I was like, what the? You know, I wish I could do that. I, I identify by feel, smell, and touch. But licking, I, I don't even know if I'd want to test it out myself. I mean, it's kind of funny. Um, but hey, every, it just comes to show every cobbler has their own uh, technique and way of doing things. Um, but anyways, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and heat up these heel bases. I'm going to stick them on. I heat them up just enough to activate the glue and try to get things to start softening up. But I can't, I can't overdo it just because, um, again, these are two layers of leather. That glue can deactivate at this point. So it's just a little bit that I'm going to have it in there for in the oven. I'm going to stick it under the press, press it down nice and hard, and then uh, run it through the... Uh, well pressed that we have there i'm gonna let it cure overnight and then tomorrow morning i'll be able to come in and check to see where i need to adjust the pitch sand it down and then continue on with what we need to do so i'll see everybody back here to me it's gonna be tomorrow but for you guys it's gonna be a second or two basically so i'll see you back in just hey everyone i'm back again already uh, so i've let these uh, sit and cure overnight and i've gone ahead and um sanded everything, trimmed it up. I'd grab the uh, original heel blocks here, or heel bases, whatever you want to call them, and measured everything out to see, you know, where I need to grind it down to make sure I get that angle just right. Um, because with the Allen Edmonds and a few other brands out there, typically the inside portion of this heel base right here is a little bit larger, thicker than the outside edge right here. That kind of helps give the arch support feature to it and helps with stability. So that was one thing I was really making sure to try to replicate. And that's one thing we always try to replicate with uh, Allen Edmonds and the other brands that do have that kind of feature to them. So it just takes a little more time usually. I mean, it's, it's just a bunch of sanding, so I didn't end up recording that aspect of it. Uh, just because it's just sanding, sanding, measuring out, you know, taking this piece and laying it up and seeing how it all lines up and and then taking the uh, the top left heels, where, where did I put them? Uh, they're over here, let me grab them. Uh, the top left heels over here and just placing it underneath and seeing how everything sits and all that and just back and forth and back and forth. So it's a little too much back and forth type of stuff to have to really be able to record anyways so it's just been all just fast forwarding of me sanding so i didn't show that on a camera uh, but at this point i'm going to go ahead and start running nails in with alan edmonds uh, typically the nails are ran in from the outside of the shoe where a lot of other brands out there especially if they are um instead of a 360 welt meaning it's not stitched all the way around if they're using a heel ren on the back area here usually they're nailed in from the inside even a lot of companies that are full 360 welt as well, they still nail them in from the inside because they have some form of heel pad or an insole that covers it that's glued over top. And uh, Allen Edmonds doesn't quite have that. We can technically nail these from the inside. We would just have to be able to cover those nail heads up afterwards. But um, we're trying to keep everything original on these. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start getting ready to nail these down. Typically the Allen Edmonds, they have a total of seven nails running through it, and that's what we're going to do as well. Uh, you don't really need much more than that. Uh, some some builds also, even five nails you can get away with. Usually it's just one in the center and a few down the sides here. Uh, as far as the layout, however, I do it a little bit differently than Allen Edmonds because this inside portion right here where the heel block is, like right here, it has a tendency to 
come up after a period of time comes unglued it's not going to come off completely your whole heel block isn't going to come off because the nails are holding it in place nicely it's just that edge right there always comes undone and sometimes even the outside edge too and that's typically due to the fact that there's the hole right here from the original nail right there and you can see how far away that is from the edge so that's just not a good positioning so i'm going to reposition our nail to sit roughly about right here um, equivalent to what their original one is so that's what I'm gonna do now because these uh, these are after all JR leather heels I definitely have to pre punch them beforehand because otherwise just running a nail through it it is it is not easy to do this leather is really tough it even breaks the awls sometimes see there's my awl getting stuck already jeez oh, that thing is really in there it comes to show how dense this stuff is. I had another all like this somewhere. Somebody gone and stole it from me. Or it might have been one that broke. Because I have one right here that ended up getting bent as well. I use that for plucking uh, thread now. So, what am I going to do? Actually, we just repurposed a new one. Let me go grab that one. Sorry, I had to grab that new one. Uh, so it's not an awl, actually. This is a punch tool. Usually it's kind of flat on the end, but we ended up repurposing it for being able to do this because sometimes running those awls through here is not a not an easy thing to do. So because this one is more solid metal, it makes it a lot easier to work with. Now, if any of you are wondering, as you can tell with the Allen Edmund heel, there's this uh, rubber pad on the top here, this buffer pad. It's equivalent to what, what a midsole material would be. And the reason why Allen Edmonds put, puts this on there, there's a few reasons. First reason is because, after all, these heel bases are a composite material, not an actual leather. Um, so... A lot of adhesives don't bond to it properly. Uh, sometimes also they end up uh, kind of bonding in such a way that if you catch a corner of the top lift heel, like this one here when we're pulling it off, it just peels like that. See how some of it got torn off basically from the actual heel block onto the buffer rubber there. And that buffer piece is there to be able to adhere top lifts onto this a little bit better and more efficiently in other words um so that's the key reason why they add that in there because after all they also run the nails over top through this buffer heel or buffer pad um that that way the top lifts are a little bit more secured and everything we don't need to do that with this because this is leather leather bonds very well to rubber at least certain rubbers and everything and so we don't need any kind of buffer pad the other thing is composite material is actually harder uh, than leather. Leather has poor structures, it's got fiber uh, structures and everything, so it still has naturally certain give to it, so it has absorption. Even though this is a JR leather and it's very dense, you still have to consider the fact that when you're, you know, when you're a gentleman that weighs 150, 180, 200, 300, 400 pounds, and 400 pounds, that's, uh, that's a lot of pressure to put on it, but, the uh, JR leather is still going to hold up to it, but at the same time with all that pressure, you still need a little bit of give. And it's just that right amount of give where if you try pressing with your fingers, you're not going to feel that give. But when you're standing with all that force on the back of the heel, it actually um, gives just a little bit and forms properly to your walking patterns and everything and uh, absorbs impact a little bit better. Where this composite material, it's highly pressurized and, uh, and it becomes very dense. And because it has no flex flexibility or anything like that, it doesn't absorb impact as well and doesn't form properly either, where the leather will. So because of that, for impact absorption and some flexibility in the overall way that everything wears out this buffer pad actually you may start to notice on some of them will start to flatten out after a period of time because this composite material actually flattens a lot better than the composite material would uh, you know it's it might sound terrible like oh no my heel bases or heel blocks are flattening out that's 
that's actually a good thing because it mimics and matches your walking pattern. Everyone has a different one. It's the same reason you know, why we always recommend using cork as the inlay inside the leather heel blocks. They're going to mimic the proper structure for your walking pattern. Uh, it's like uh, comparing the uh, rocker bottom soles on those athletic footwear or ones that are certain builds, like they have different twists and turns. They're designed to mimic certain walking patterns. Dress shoes, however, they don't have that ability to mimic it in such a way. So what happens is when you use proper materials or proper additions like this heel buffer here, it's going to start to mold to your particular walking pattern, becomes a little more... Uh, more beneficial for your uh, walking basically so i just thought i'd point that out to anybody that might be familiar with uh with how cobblers work or familiar with how alan edmonds work or if you've ever worked on your own shoes shining or anything and you saw that there are two layers of black material it's not necessarily that we're going to be replacing that uh, buffer pad for keeping the original heel bases. And a lot of times we do keep the original heel bases. We try to we try to keep as much of the original as possible because the shoes are already broken in. And uh, we want to keep that broken in aspect so you don't have to re-break it in as much as possible. Where these shoes for... Sorry, I have to nail a little bit. For Simon, they're brand new, so he hasn't had a chance to break them in. He's got a bunch of upgrades to them and everything, so he's going he's gonna to have some great stuff going on there. But continuing on, we've got these uh, 5 8 inch threaded nails, and that's usually what Alan Edmonds uses as well. A lot of other shoe factories also use that. These particular nails um, are used for when being nailed in from the inside or the outside because they have these little rings across them that just little round circles almost like you, you can say like a screw has just screw score swirls basically where these are just straight rings and they're slightly angled upwards so once the nail goes in pulling it back out you need a bit of force to pull it out so it really secures everything nicely and that, that's how we end up securing it and they're 5 8 inch which is a perfect perfect up oh, there goes a nail perfect height or length to go through the heel block and into the sole itself sorry a phone call come through and it just uh kind of interrupted what i was uh, talking about but anyways these nails will go perfectly through that heel block and into the sole sometimes a little bit into the midsole depending on how thick the mid the regular sole is itself and so it really grips nicely across all these layers that we have here of everything. Now, the nails that I'm putting in, and this may make a handful of cobblers a little jealous because the, even Alan Edmonds would make jealous a little bit. They are the old star nails. So, so Simon, you are getting the best because this company is out of business. Nobody has these in stock. Everyone's been trying to hunt down a replacement or alternative for them that works just as well. Unfortunately, the new replacements that everyone's been getting in from everywhere, and that includes Allen Edmonds and all the other shoe companies and manufacturers around the world, um, we can't get this same grade of nail. The new ones are not as great as they are. So, while we still got them, and that's what I'm using at the moment on all, my, all the shoes that I'm working on personally myself, um, if they're, if they're being worked on by me, this is my personal stash of those. I'm probably, after I'm almost out of these, I'm still going to save about maybe a hundred nails, uh, or maybe 50 nails just for my own personal shoes. But in the meantime, I'm still using these for, for that. Sorry, I keep getting interrupted, but yeah, that's one of the. One of the bad things about our industry is uh, when when a company goes out of business or shuts down or anything like that, it's very hard to find replacements for it. But anyways, there are the nails there. Where previously, I don't know if you if you can see it. Got all that. Now, right now, obviously, of course, the heel base that we have on here is a little bit wider. It still has a little ways to go to be shaved down slightly, just just ever so slightly because. 
one of the dilemmas we always come across with the Allen Edmonds is that they taper these heels in just way too much. I mean, just way too much. It's it's almost like turning a dress shoe into Western boot. Dress shoes are supposed to have more of a straight cut heel. You know, where these guys, they're they're beveled inward just just way too much all around and they shouldn't be this much but uh, you know once we've got the top lift heel on we're still gonna be sanding everything out a little bit more and going going through the whole process so we leave just a little extra to be able to accommodate that for for the whole thing but at this point um, you know these are coming along we're just gonna finish running the nails in through the heel base here and uh, start gluing everything up and double layer glue on the, the heel base again because it's leather single coat on the JR heels kind of sucks still didn't get those gold labeled JRs in I, I don't know why why they do that they make some with the gold label some without it's like back and forth with them uh, with our suppliers uh, with JR also. For anyone that might be wondering, I've done a whole uh, Soul Talk Sunday episode about JR soles. And, um, you know, when you come across the JR soles or heels, let me see if I have one. There we go. As you can tell, there's one with a gold label, one that doesn't have the gold label. Doesn't mean that there's one that's better than the other. The gold label is not better than this one. This one's not better than that one. They're the same. They're treated the same and everything. The only thing is, as you can tell, sometimes you'll get a little bit of color variant uh, difference. I mean, this one package that I had come in of JR Heels, this same package right there. I mean, look at that difference between the shades. That's normal. These are leather. They're treated. They're not dyed. They're not, um, you know, altered in any kind of way. They're all the same. It's leather. It turns out slightly different because of the tanning process. So if you're having a pair done that has no finish on it, if it's just a neutral color, you may end up with, uh, you know, two heels like that. We just put like a light coat of Saphir products just to kind of give it a seal basically with the waxes. And you may end up with uh, two different shades slightly. It's very normal. It's leather after all. Um, reacts differently during the oak bark tanning process in color but the main goal that JR Leather is after is to make sure that there is a consistency with the durability of the leather and uh, how it's tanned that's what they're after they don't care much about the finish and color the color finishes on us cobblers if we're going to be doing anything like the sole here we did a little bit of red so if you want red we could do red you want blue we could do blue do you want just a neutral finish we could do that or just a straight brown or black or tan or whatever it might be so you know just wanted to point that out to anybody that might be wondering all across the board the JR soles are all the same excluding one which is the um, JR flex sole it's tanned a little bit differently uh, so that the leather is still very flexible the flexibility of that sole is equivalent to what your house grade leathers typically would be but um, because of that, because it's a little bit softer to be flexible, it's not quite as durable as uh, as the original JR soles, but it's still a lot more durable than a lot of other soles out there on, on the market. So you kind of get a little bit of both worlds. You get the flexibility of a softer sole with that JR Flex and a higher grade dur durability compared to all other leather soles out there on the market where the traditional JR soles, the graffiti JR soles, the combination JR soles, they're all full treated, tanned like they are traditionally, and so you get the full durability aspect of it. Not so much on the flexibility, unfortunately. But I still prefer the regular ones, not the JR Flex as much, just because it's leather, it's gonna break in, it has a break in period that you have to allow it to go through, and just, just be patient with it. It's the same thing as breaking a new pair of shoes. Uh, Simon's going to have a little bit of breaking in with these shoes regardless because they're a brand new pair that he's never worn. He had them shipped directly to, to the shop here, which, which is actually common. You know, I do get a fair amount of people that just have uh, shoes directly shipped to me. They want uh, something done with them, um, adding toe plates or before they end up wearing the shoes or adding a protective sole or... Sorry, I'm gonna make some noise. 
or a, a, G, a GTO crosshatch half sole. You know, there's a number of things that people ship stuff into us brand new, um, like the Christian Louis Vuittons with the red bottoms. Gentlemen and women also, they ship them into us before they, or bring them into us as well, before they even wear them, before they really even try them on. They're familiar with that particular model and know that that model fits them very well in that size and that size. They're very well, well aware that the shoes are still handmade to an extent, so there's going to be a break-in period regardless. But they're comfortable enough that they will uh, have them shipped to us directly from the facilities that they were pull, um, stocking these shoes at. So, you know, it's, uh, it's nothing new to us. But uh, it's a fairly common occurrence. I've probably got maybe four or five pairs here at the shop like that right now where people just have them shipped directly to us i have no problem with that i understand some people want to wear them first for a little while or wear out the original soles or whatever it's up to your own discretion what are you after with your shoes are you just enjoying the shoes the way they are and want to eventually upgrade it and just wear out the original sole as much as possible or right right out of the box you want everything done to them like simon wants with his shoes you know it's it's completely up to you which route you want to take and what your decision is on that so i'm not going to tell you you know as soon as you get your shoes you gotta send them straight to us and do all the upgrades you want no brand new out of the box I, there's only one thing that i will always always recommend that you must do and that is going to be first is condition it because these shoes from the factory are never fully treated. Now they're dyed, they're buffed up, maybe a little bit of wax is added to it, but there is never any conditioner added to it. There's no treatment done to it. They will put a finish coat over top of it so that it's presentable on display or new out of the box. So sometimes you may have to clean it up a little bit beforehand with uh, like Sofia Reno mat, which is this stuff here. It'll take off some of that finish that they put on there a little bit. But that can vary depending on the type of shoes they are, the brand as well. So you might not want to use Reno Mat. You may just want to use some saddle soap or easy cleaner. After you clean it, condition it thoroughly. Uh, Saphir Modal Dior Renovator is what we prefer because it's got your mean coil, your lanolin, and beeswax. And that's going to be your bare minimum that is like a must that I would highly recommend. Now, getting into suede and new bucks, that's, that's a different story. If you're doing suede or new bucks, brand new out of the box, you don't have to do much else. The only thing that you you have to do is uh, waterproof. You know, out of the box, if I get a pair of suede or new buck shoes, new buck is a little bit finer than regular suede, I would take a nylon brush um, and just brush it up. I don't know if I have one in here anywhere, but nylon means that it's, yeah, I guess I took it out of this drawer here. It must be in the back for now. But nylon brush is the same types of brittle bristles that you would find on a toothbrush just a little bit larger a little bit thicker and just kind of brush it over real quick get any old dust or anything off of it in case there was some dust at some point on them get all that off of there um you know maybe just blow it off with some compressed air if you have it not in a not in a can don't ever use that on your shoes don't use canned compressed air just if you have an air compressor like we use back here just spritz it off if so if you don't just brush it off and kind of you know brush it off with the um, nylon brush a little a little quicker more vigorously don't apply too much pressure and it'll kind of fly off on its own after uh, after you've brushed it off it's ready for waterproofers there are great ones out there Saphir's got it it's uh, super nulver that's for your high quality suede's and new bucks uh, definitely highly recommend that uh, if they are uh, something that you don't really you're not too worried about necessarily than nothing crazy high end and you know you don't want to waste your super and over because it is on the pricier side when you're comparing prices uh we carry the uh, what was it uh, four seasons waterproofer which is water based so that means that it's a little more delicate it'll work on um, all sorts of suede and new bucks and then there's the other one the uh, Tarago Nano which is great the only problem is that it is silicone based and so it's it's a lot stronger you only you probably only need to apply it maybe once every six months to a year I usually recommend those on hiking boots work boots you know something more outdoorsy um, because it is silicone based in other words it's a little harder to clean up afterwards um, 
uh, to, if you're going to do any additional kind of treatment or anything like that. But uh, that's going to be one of your strongest ones, stronger than even the Saphir Supernova. The Saphir one, they have to make a little bit weaker to remove any silicones like that. They do that on purpose because high quality suede, you want to be able to treat them a little bit better. Uh, maybe use the Saphir Suede Renovating Spray to condition it or touch up color. Um, so you want to use something that's not overpowering, but at the same time does the job right. But anyways, I've been babbling too much about it. If you have any other questions about that in particular, comment down below, give me a call, swing on by, send a message. You know, you can get all our information on our website, cobblersplus.com. So before I continue talking too much, just uh, hit us up on any of, uh, any of those uh, social media pages here on YouTube or in person or over the phone, whatever works for you. Anyways, I'm going to finish out this one here with the nailing. We've already got this one taken care of. I'm going to go ahead and get the glue taken care of and then stick it together and let it cure for a little while. After it's all cured, I'm going to go ahead and do the rough sanding on these because we do have to cut them and do the rough sanding. When we're going to start doing our final sanding, I'll start recording then just because it's uh, it's fun to see the sparks fly off of these toe plates because we still have to do a little bit of adjusting, sanding all that out there, those minor edges. So let's make the sparks fly. So we'll see you back when they start flying. All right, so we're back here again, and I've got the heel done the same way as well. I left it just a little bit rougher on the heel. Um, heels tend to get replaced. I was really debating on leaving that original uh, JR collar, which is kind of like that right there. Um, very much debating it, but you know, it's uh, it was one of those I last minute decided to go ahead and change it out. Heels end up getting replaced a little more frequently than any other part of the shoe. So down the road, if uh, Simon decides to send them back to us or any other cobbler, he could always request to keep the heel neutral if he decides to change the color. So heels aren't a big issue. Um, but did the same exact process with uh, with the heel here by taping it all off. But before I do that, I'm actually going to grab one of these uh, channel tools here. This is designed to cut out a little bit of a channel, not quite as deep of a channel as where we're stitching it, um, but uh, just just deep enough where I gotta be a little on the creative side in other words with it so I'm just gonna go through and just do the leather there we go cuts out just a little sliver like that right there and so it looks like that and what I'm gonna end up doing is uh, you know I was uh, I was thinking about it a few times between doing red or brown in that little sliver and it's, it's getting very hard for me to decide which one might be the better option I don't know why should I do brown should I do red because if I do red it matches up with the stitching if I do brown it gives a little bit of a different contrast it, you know because there's so much red down here at the bottom already that maybe I should take away a little bit of red so I might actually go ahead and just do a little bit of brown right here on the channels. So let me go grab some brown paint real quick. It's a special type of paint you'll see in just a second. Okay, so the paint I have here is the Andrelis acrylic paints. These are designed for uh, leather goods, footwear, man-made materials like that as well. Um, I ended up going with the light brown that was the medium brown as an option too, but the light brown It's got a little bit more of a reddish tint to it. So I thought, you know, it'll, it'll still leave a little bit of a hint of red The problem is these things keep getting stuck on me. So I Gotta use some pliers to open it up There we go and these things are great because you do like minor touch-ups every now and then here here and there with it also especially if you have a uh, a corrected grain leather or man-made material so ladies these things will really come in handy for you these acrylic paints because ladies shoes majority of them out there they have um, synthetic man-made materials on them and even if they are leather too, it's going to be great to touch it up because with the ladies shoes, if you have a pointed toe, you can easily touch up that toe a little more frequently and this stuff is fairly durable too. So 
Well, where the small investment comes in a variety of colors, I mean, you can go with neons, um, you can go with uh, standard colors, blacks and browns, uh, you can get yellow, green, number of colors. Okay. And it's just a little bit. I'm actually using my finger to wipe off some of the excess off just, just a tiny bit. And that's why we want to make sure we also do the finish beforehand because if I try doing this right now before I put that uh, brown finish on um, it ends up getting absorbed into the leather just a little bit too much Dang it. I was not being steady with my hand there I don't know, it doesn't stick out too much with that, but it's just a little fine detail that it's kind of cool. I've done this before on another pair of shoes. I think uh, I ended up matching the color of the stitches. I believe it was a green stitch that we did, and so we matched it up but because these ones have so much red already in them. Thought I'd give it a little bit of contrast. And I didn't want to go in like some opposite direction in color with, uh, say, a a blue or a purple or anything it just too much color too much different variety of color is overkill and too little as well and i think this would just make it perfect so it's not very noticeable very subtle just a small little decorative add-on but i like it Gives, gives a little touch. Again, heels get up replaced a little more uh, a little more frequently. So if Simon decides to change his mind or wants something else, he can he can do that on the next round. Heels end up wearing out quicker, even on the finish here because it's a heel after all. So let me find my tool. There it is. So it's not a big major concern if. Uh, if it's not exactly what he might want, I mean, I make it sound kind of horrible and almost sound like I'm controlling here, but finishes on bottoms of soles, they don't stay long. Keep that in mind. They wear out, they're, they're supposed to wear out, kind of. It's, it's a nice touch decoratively when he sees them for the first time. Now, obviously the uh the red right here underneath the arch area that's going to stay red for a good while because it doesn't wear out as easily but areas that tend to get a lot of wear ball of foot toe areas um you know the heel it's gonna it's gonna wear out pretty fast by the way if you guys see him in the background there's sea bass over there say hi hi what are you doing? Drinking tea, messing with your hair, and playing a game. We're going to have to have uh, Seabass end up shining a couple of shoes I have back here in a little bit anyways. I was going to hand them off to him, but Simon had a bit of a request. He was really hoping for Jason Dornstar to actually take care of the uppers on these. So I'm going to talk to Jason and see if he can come by sometime soon and grab them and uh, have him do a video on that. So uh, Jason's usually really flexible with that. But if you wanna check out that video, I'll leave a link in the description and also um, check out his channel, Jason Dornstar. Uh, and check him out on YouTube and on Instagram. I think it's the same Jason Dornstar or Dornstar Shines. I believe he's got two accounts there, but definitely check them out. So at this point, uh, I added the second layer of that acrylic paint there, so it's looking a lot better with that second coat, better than the first one. So a little more, a little more noticeable than it's brown. Now at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and grab our little tool here. This is uh, kind of like a compass tool. I can't remember what they're called exactly, but in other words, it's a marking tool. It's to mark where I'm going to have the nails put in. Kind of gives them evenly more even spacing and everything now obviously i can just eyeball it and get it fairly close but 
I've been liking this a little bit more here just because there have been a handful of times where I got distracted by someone or something and ended up putting the nails in kind of like a odd spot or something and it just didn't line up right. So this gives me a little bit more peace of mind when I do it this way. And they're spaced uh, one centimeter apart. And the nails that we're using, I actually had to order these from Europe because I can't find them anywhere in the US, but they're little decorative round headed nails like this. I've got some flat headed ones too that I still haven't used yet. I'm almost tempted to. Simon, we'll change it out for you. We'll go with the Nah, sorry Simon. Didn't mean to get your hopes up. We're gonna stick to the rounded ones. The rounded ones in particular, they grip better when it comes to rubber, actually, I've noticed. Um, uh, just because it's got a little bit of certain texturing right across the nail area here, and so it just grab, it grasps the, uh, the rubber a lot better, even though we have leather and rubber combination. In the long run, I've been liking these round-headed ones a little bit better. But at this point, I'm going to grab my punch awl here that I was using for the toe plates. And same thing, follow the markings that I left here and just start hammering them through. Now, I can just grab the nail and just hammer it straight in, but nails, after all, because it's a thinner metal, they, uh, they can bend, they can end up breaking, and I just don't want that small little thing of, you know, that small problem of a nail just bending and damaging that finish that I put all that time and effort into. So, take that extra step, punch the holes, it's going to save you a lot of headache. And I could get a little more creative with the nail patterns and everything as well. But because I put in that little line right here with that brown Andrews acrylic paint, I think it's a little better just to keep a little keep it somewhat more uniform. You get too much different patterns all at once. It gets a little funny looking in other words. After all, cobblers are artistes. So we gotta we gotta think about what goes together and what clashes. I don't want anything to clash too much in these. These shoes are already really awesome beasts. Between having a vibram midsole and a JR leather sole, as well as the GTO half sole and a triumph toe plate. And JR dovetail heels, these things are masterpieces, basically a combination of a lot of things going on all at once. Alright, so I've got all the nails in, now we're going to punch them down a little bit deeper with our other punch tool here. This one's got a flatter tip, so it's not sharp. This will allow us to punch these nails down just a little, a little bit deeper. That way the heads don't stick out and there's a chance that maybe one of them might pop out or become slippery when he's walking. There we go. Now after that Angelus acrylic paint is all dry, we're able to buff that out, but before we start really buffing it out, I'll still let it dry for a little bit, and then we still have to sand out and trim all the edges everywhere around. Obviously I already did the uh, heel here, sanding it out on the rough sander, and we're going to have to move over to the smoother sand paper belt in a little bit. So, what do you guys think? Do you prefer neutral heel or adding a little bit of nails and stuff? All right, so we've got both uh, heels finished out right there. I was debating on doing all sorts of other things to it and stuff, um, maybe some tooling work or any of that, but 
there's a lot going on already in this shoe with all the amazing things but I just felt like it'd be overkill if I start adding certain like tooling designs or any of the other stuff and I still want to have a little bit of um, you know a little bit of plainness to it I guess you can put it that way so I think I'm fairly happy there with that heel right there got a little bit of brown I mean it's not too noticeable it's gonna wear out fast and all that as far as the design I mean not crazy fast but semi fast anyways so I thought I'd go ahead and just uh, leave it at this point now for anyone that might be wondering why I didn't put that gentleman's notch in I wasn't going to do it yet and well before I did the bottom stain and before I did all the nailing for multiple reasons one is obviously when I start doing this uh, little channel section here makes it a little bit more of an even surface area um, the other reason of course is for um, for the finish we want to make sure we put that on like normal and that little gentleman's notch usually needs to have the same color matchup as the edge dressing on them and so that's why I didn't put it in for anyone that doesn't know what a gentleman's notch is I'm gonna go ahead and do that during the sanding process it's basically cutting off that inside corner right there it's kind of a traditional thing that cobblers do at least a handful of cobblers because for many years uh, men's footwear they would uh, they would put that in there just because of a few reasons one is because gentlemen in order to try to keep their pants from getting all wrinkled up or anything until the very last minute they would dress up they would put everything on their shoes would go on first and pants would finally go on second to last before the blazer or jacket and uh, that little corner piece would always get caught up in the pants and tear them so the gentleman's notch was started uh, to be implemented at that point so it didn't rip or damage the pants the other reason is also with uh, uh, cuffs uh, like uh, pant cuffs you know sometimes you get like that rolled up section right there at the pants and, you know, sometimes they're large sometimes they're small but when a gentleman's walking the cuff can sometimes end up getting caught right there in that corner just enough where again it would rip and get damaged so you know the gentleman's notch comes into play for multiple reasons now obviously most men nowadays uh, don't do that where they put on their shoes before they put on their pants um, with all the great materials out there now they don't tend to wrinkle up as easily anymore but it's still a traditional thing that a lot of cobblers still do and so we're going to go ahead and implement that as well for these shoes and you can actually find it on a lot of original factory shoes too alan edmund does that on the on their shoes too and you know um, other brands too so we're going to go ahead and get that taken care of so let's go ahead and get started on our sanding Alright, so there's that gentleman's notch right there. Um, obviously, the inside here with the brister comb that we have down here, I've already touched up this edging before, or the inside area, before we uh, did the bottom stain on it, but got the area here all sanded down. Now, there's a few ways of being able to do that. We can either sand it or we can trim it, but because we have such a combination of materials here, we've got two rubbers, we've got two layers of leather, and we've got metal there. It's a lot better to sand always. I'm going to go ahead and readjust the camera. We're going to switch over to our numb keg up top here and let you guys check what that looks like from up close to do final touch-ups. All right, so this up here is what's called a numb keg pad. Let me just readjust it because one of our guys, he always likes to, oops, shook the whole thing, likes to readjust it downward a little bit. I prefer a little up, so we're always going back and forth with this thing, so, oh, there we go. Whew. But um, it's just a light sandpaper, basically, that just spins around like that there, and it's just going to do some final touch-ups here and there for us, uh, like touching up these little corner edges so you can possibly see like a little fringe sticking up so just small little fine details here and there around the gto sole there there's little little small frizzies always to do some good to do some final touches so let's go ahead and get started on that This 
off real quick. Let me blow off my face too. There's a lot of dust everywhere. So might be able to possibly tell a little bit of a uh, difference there. Possibly. So this is definitely much smoother where this one's rougher right there because we went through on the rougher sandpaper belt to get this all taken care of and then no well, not all taken care of but all cut down because that heel block had a lot of uh a, a lot of pieces sticking out still and we had to make sure to get that down toe plates right there definitely definitely more tapered down and everything so we're almost done got just a few more things to do and uh get it going still got one more pair for simon i'm working on back there too i'm not doing a video on that one that one i think was uh just standard gto that we were doing where this pair we were going all out on it um, for him so i'm gonna go ahead and finish off this one off camera real quick and we'll move on over to edge dressing and doing the all well, the edge ink the waxing of the edges and all that so we'll see you back over in that All right, everyone. So we're back here again. I had to, unfortunately, um, get to a certain point, stop, and end up going home. Uh, my wife was 
craving pizza. She's uh, pregnant at the, at the time of this video being recorded. And uh, you don't want to deal with a pregnant wife that's hungry for some pizza. So, yeah, uh, we, me and Sebastian had to rush out of here. Uh, otherwise, I'd end up uh, probably not making it back in here after that one. I lost my head. But, uh, anyways. Right now, what I'm doing is going through with some, uh, some turpentine here. I'm just cleaning off some of the waxes around the edge. And yes, obviously it's a, a very tedious and time consuming thing because I'm using a Q-tip and on and on. And it's just little by little having to take off small amounts of this wax because obviously when you varnish it and you buff it, you're still gonna have small residues left over. And we're gonna buff it one more time afterwards, but just not with so much force and pressure. With all that force it kind of uh, makes the wax really stick to this rubber and vibram rubber is fairly sticky at least this particular model of vibram I should have should have double checked what the name of it is I'll, I'll do that later and mention it towards the end of the video although we are getting closer and closer being done at least on our end Okay, so I've got these uh, kind of cleaned up, taken off some of the finish area here, uh, here and there. There's some spots, uh, was it on this one? No, I think it was the other one. Originally from the factory, I don't know if I pointed this out, but I think I did. Um, that discoloration from the lace area there, it's gonna happen, you know, and that's nothing we can really take off. We end up taking off a lot of that uh, spotting. Sorry, I didn't know if it uh, showed well enough. We'll end up taking a lot of that spotting off, but along with it, we'll end up taking a lot of the finish off. So I just put on the first coat of the um, Saphir Modal Dior, Dior, trying to pronounce it properly, with um, the number three light brown Pomadier cream, uh, just to get a little bit of the color restored again. And I may go through another time and do it one more time on that. But for now, I thought I'd grab the Hermes Red and uh, touch up this bottom of the sole just a little bit more. In certain areas, because again, during the process, it kind of loses that shimmer. And I could go back and go ahead and use the, uh, the Cherry Red that I had, but the Modal, the Modal, sorry, I can't talk right now. The Modal Duo has a little more extra dye pigment, so it'd be nice to have that on there. Just as an extra layer, in other words. There we go. Plus it actually works very well as a cleaning agent for Certain areas, like if I get a little bit of the uh, edge varnish ink on here on accident, because there is uh, turpentine in this after all, and uh, just a little extra vigorous scrubbing and it helps take it off. So, there we go. I'm gonna set that aside to dry. Actually, before I even take it off the last, gotta make sure to clean up that toe tip. Because as you had seen, I was wiping off the edge ink off the shoe and sole. But on the metal, it likes to stick quite a bit. So you don't get it all off the first time as quickly and easily. So just 
taking it off just a little bit. There we go. Yes, I know after all these uh, these are metal and they're going to get beaten up and everything and so on and so on, but why not clean them up just a little bit beforehand, make them look a little, a little nicer. Afterwards they're going to get buffed out and look a little more shiny, basically. Set that one aside there. And just do the same thing with this one. up so hopefully everyone's been enjoying this video so far I mean it's again kind of a longer one and so I'm gonna have to do the whole two part on it and I'm really doing this video because uh, by request for Simon he he really won he, he really likes the in-depth stuff and those of you who don't know uh, Simon is a very active person on all those groups on Facebook um, the uh, Alan Edmund enthusiast Alden enthusiast he's fairly active on those uh, waxed and dyed North American shoe builders I mean he's always uh, jumping in and uh, getting in on conversations and starting conversations so is very active in the group got a lot of freebies and everything but oh, that's uh that's not quite why why we're going all out for for these for him he uh he had gifted me a couple pairs alan edmonds um which again i still got to show you guys i think i mentioned that in the beginning of the video let me go see if i have them here in the back otherwise i'm gonna have to grab them a little bit later if i didn't bring them with me I keep forgetting because i don't wear them at the shop too often i do not want to spill any of this stuff on those shoes but let me go grab them while this is all drying because I do want the waxes to dry in this bottom stain or the pomadier cream. I want it to dry so that afterwards I can buff it up and then we'll continue on with the next steps. So let's set that aside for now and be back in just a little bit then I'm sure we'll set, set them on their side. All right. All right, so I did have my Allen Edmonds that uh, Simon ended up sending over to me. So I've got a pair of Park Avenues here. That he, These were the first pair that he gifted me. He found them uh, used, I think, at a thrift store or something like that. And they were barely used. I, I, I put on a lot more miles on these than they than they had before. Now, obviously, I still have the original soles and heels on them. I haven't done anything. Cobblers have a tendency to neglect their own stuff a lot of times because... Priority number one is everyone else's shoes. Ours are in last place always. You know, every now and then I get around to shining these or something. I mean, I had a mirror shine on them, but it's already starting to wear out and got nicked a little here when I was wearing them last time, and I haven't got around to fixing that up. Same thing with these. Um, but however, these Corn Wallaces, these are the, uh, I think they called it the Midnight Blue, basically a navy blue color. And, um, these were brand new that he got for me they were getting discontinued and i was like oh my god i want a pair and so simon ended up getting me a pair i was like oh man this guy's awesome so everybody give him a shout out on there and this video is for simon on those so there now we're working on his shoes so i'm gonna go ahead and uh continue on working with these guys here. all right so back here again i buffed up that bottom a little bit more so it's got slight more shine got the edges taken care of they've got a little bit more of a shine there too now these shoes are uh all done on our end at least for for now all right everyone so we're back here again um so we ended up finding out that jason wasn't able to do a video on these he's a little backed up with a few things and uh so i ended up uh going ahead and taking care of that for uh simon but uh you know we're you, know, you could always check out Jason's channel anyways. But anyways, uh, I'd gone ahead and done a bit of a mirror shine on it. Not too crazy. I mean, as you can tell, it's got a bit more of a shine. You can see some of the reflection of the lights. And uh, there's my hand in there. Okay. So it's not crazy reflective where you can pretty much see your eyeball in it or anything like that. But um, I know Simon likes uh, a little bit more of a mirror shine on his shoes. And so... Thought I'd go ahead and 
do that for him. Put a little bit more mirror gloss on the bottom here. Just a little bit. Helps uh, helps bring out more of that shine. And I threw some uh, red waxed lace dress lace on him. I uh, can't talk. Waxed dress laces on for him that are red color. Now, obviously, in the box, I still have his original laces. So, you know, if he doesn't like the red ones and they stick out too much like a sore thumb, uh, he could always take them out. I'm not going to get upset. He can save them for some other shoes if he wants to have a little bit of fun. But I thought it would uh, look a little bit nicer. Now, I did do the Berluti knot in them for now. And uh, these laces, obviously, because they're waxed, they're gonna need a little bit of break-in period. Usually I've noticed that with a lot of wax laces, y you wanna give them a break-in period. For anybody but that might be wondering what's the difference between a wax lace and a non-wax lace, uh, typically a wax lace will hold up for a longer period of time because the wax has reinforced the fiber structure of the cotton. Uh, usually laces are cotton, sometimes they're nylon, but when you introduce wax to it, it makes it a little bit stronger. So they'll last longer, but tying them is a little bit a little bit more of a pain. You have to let them break in again as well. Um, but uh, with the Berluti knot there, it's uh, it's going to hold up very well. You know, I, I haven't had any kind of issues with them coming apart on my shoes ever. So, you know, it's, it's very simple and easy to do. Uh, I put in the uh, shoe trees for him that, that are going to basically call these shoes home for hopefully many years for Simon. It's uh, one of these guys here, cedar, and uh, these are basic treated, not like a heavy coating of any kind, so they still have that nice cedar smell to them. When you're buying shoe trees, that's definitely what you want to look for. Uh, double cylinder, so that means they've got two um, spring loads in here. It's got a nice wide heel area there to give good weight distribution, and that uh, toe piece that separates with the spring on its own too. So definitely a very nice cedar shoe tree to have and we're gonna oh, get those in for Simon there but there we go that's a full recrafting on a pair of Allen Edmond strands with the Vibra midsole JR leather full sole GTO crosshatch soles triumph toe plates and the JR dovetail heels so quite a lot in this shoe oh and as well as the mirror shine using of course nothing more than nothing less than saphir modal dior we use the pate deluxe of course i did go through and treat them again with uh saphir modal dior renovator uh, a little bit more pomadier cream to give it some more wax finally went through the entire shoe with the light brown number three uh, pate deluxe wax here after that dried for a while, buffed it up on our machine, and then gone ahead and started layering on the wax with the mirror gloss here and switching back and forth between these two. And uh, just because of Jason, I used his little water dispenser. Yeah, Jason, you left your water dispenser for me here, so I used him on these shoes. He hasn't been able to leave the house for a little while, um, so we, uh, so it's hard for him at the moment to leave the house. So I thought I'd go ahead and uh, take care of this on his behalf. And hopefully, Simon, you're okay with that. I mentioned it to you as well. And uh, I apologize to anybody else. But definitely make sure you check out his channel. I'll leave a little uh, tag up top. I don't know if it's on the left or right side. But just a little tag up top for uh, Jason's channel. Click on that. It'll take you right to his uh, channel there. And you can check out his videos. His are a little more relaxing. He doesn't talk quite as much as me. And the times that he does talk, he sounds a little bit more... Um, I guess you can say more soothing than I do me I'm hot-headed I'm all over the place and can't talk right sometimes jumble up my words and everything but I try hopefully everyone's been enjoying the videos I've been putting out um, now for part one it's already out obviously and uh, I I want to point out a few things a few people said they mentioned that they had noticed some damage or something up by the laces there really isn't any kind of 
damage here. There's a little bit of crinkling folds there, but that's actually very common. I've noticed on a lot of shoes. Um, so it, it's one of those things. If you see any kind of crinkling a little bit in that area there where the laces are, that's not a bad thing at all. Um, the only time is if you have a very narrow foot and you have to cinch it over, um, then this area may eventually start to kind of fold and look a little more wrinkled fun funny-wise. But for Simon's case, it's perfect. He's got a little bit of a wider foot. And uh, for him, these that should be a much more beneficial thing. So typically, if you have a wider foot, that's actually a very beneficial thing if there's a little bit of extra it looks like it's extra leather in other words so don't freak out don't think it's anything bad but definitely a good thing um for sure for simon's case at least i hope so simon still has to fit these he had them shipped directly from alan edmund to me so simon these things better work for you <laughs> but i'm sure i'm sure they will he's uh, fairly familiar with alan edmunds already he's obviously on the alan edmund enthusiast page so um he's all over the place there now for anybody that's wondering also uh, one last thing I'll mention as far as that upper treatment obviously we did the conditioning with the renovator cream uh, the palmetier cream it's got the waxes in there so help with repelling water significantly um, using a water proofer that's a spray on like an aerosol like Saphir on the uh, what is it called I can't remember I have it down here somewhere if I can find it I think this one's it yep and volner super and over super and over volner i don't know how you want to pronounce that i-n-v-u-l-n-e-r but uh this stuff here waterproofers there are aerosol version like this they are strictly no well, not strictly they're mostly created for suede nubuck uh certain nylon materials uh things like that for a finished leather like this I highly recommend take that extra step, at least one or two coats of the Pate Deluxe across the entire shoe. The heavier and harder waxes in here won't only just give it a little bit extra shine, but it will really help with the waterproofing aspects. Um, again, with the Pate Deluxes, there's not a lot of pigment. So this is the light brown. It looks it looks nice and light brown, but it, um, it has a very transparent pigment. So you're not gonna be able to change the color very easily. I mean, a lot of times I like to use na uh, navy blue here from the Pate Deluxe sometimes too on the toes to start darkening it, giving it natural patina. It doesn't darken it, you know, very easily. It takes, uh, you know, at least three or four times of you applying this over a period of time before you start to notice that there's a patina starting to form and build. You won't be able to do much for it right away. Um, now, one thing if anybody had noticed, I'm going through with this uh, this little all here, and just if I catch some wax because obviously these have broguing on them, I end up uh, taking it out with this little all here. Now broguing, of course, is this uh, these holes here, and on a pair of shoes, typically the more broguing you have, the more of a casual shoe it's considered to be. The less broguing, the more of a dress or formal type shoe it would be. So these ones are considered to be a casual, and especially with the red in there and all that going on all at once, these are technically considered to be more of a casual shoe. Everyday wear, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, so just wanted to point that out. Any other questions or comments, feel free to ask. Comment down below, um, send us a message, go to our website, cobblersplus.com. All of our contact information is on there. Uh, send us an email, pictures. Uh, swing on by if you're local here in the Denver area. If you're not, uh, we have plenty of instructions about mail-in orders if you need to ship things to us as well. And uh, you know, we'd be happy to help with whatever questions you may have, whether it's about Saphir, or JR Leather, you know, what we think about Alan Edmonds or other builds of shoes too um, you know some we do have some people that email us that are very new to the footwear collecting and who are new to quality footwear and so they message us and ask us hey what do you think of these five brands of shoes like or these two brands of shoes and things like that you know and we'll be honest about it to you as much as we can we'll try to explain in great detail everything that we see wrong and right in the shoes and as always, if you enjoyed this video, give us a thumbs up. I definitely appreciate it. Uh, it shows that uh, 
you've been enjoying our videos and give us comments on what you'd like to see more of uh do you want do you enjoy these longer videos where we have like part one part two i know the part one was very long about an hour and a half long it was more in depth with everything i've had people tell me that they enjoy the longer videos i've had people tell me that they prefer the shorter videos you know comment down below i want to see how many of you want a shorter video how many people of you have been enjoying the longer ones these shoes again because these are for simon he's somebody that prefers the longer videos so i was definitely going to try to stick to keeping up with the longer videos for him i still have to make sure i grab him a pair a shoe slide where to go let me grab one sorry didn't see the shoe slide right away but one of these here gotta make sure i put that on the box for him Anyone that's uh, not familiar with them, check them out, shoeslide.com. And uh, we also have them in here. They're little handy-dandy thin shoehorns that will definitely help you significantly saving the heels back here and helping you put on your shoes a little more efficiently. So definitely going to have to add those in the box for Simon. I've got another pair I'm working on for him as well. They're a pair of, what were they, McAllister's in the coffee color. We're just doing the GTO crosshatch half sole with the Triumph toe plate. Not going all out on those for him, but these ones he definitely wanted all out on them. So I got to finish those out, get them all boxed up. And Simon, hopefully you'll see your shoes shortly. Simon uh, was fine with me posting these videos before he actually received the shoes. So thank you very much, Simon. Thanks for the opportunity to work on your shoes and go all out on them, basically doing weird and crazy stuff sometimes. Um, and I hope you've been enjoying the video and everyone else as well. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button and the notification bell icon to be notified when we have our next video released. And we'll see everyone next time.